Well, I want to welcome everyone to our worship time together again, and in particular on this Thanksgiving Sunday, uh, we here at Russia Grown's Church hope that you're doing well and that you've uh, maybe even had some time today, if you haven't done this already, to just maybe be still for a little bit and, and take a sort of inventory, think through your life a little bit of some of the blessings um, that you have. Like, what are, what are you thankful in life for today? What are some of the blessings that God's given to you that you might even sometimes take for granted or, or even just thinking about this week, the week that we've just come through? What are even maybe one or two experiences that you've had that made your life a little bit better? Like just taking a few minutes to think about that or, or, or writing it down, even some people make a regular practice of that. It is such a healthy thing for us to exercise. And along those same lines, and I think this is kind of appropriate on Thanksgiving weekend, here today we're continuing in our Be Cheerful series of messages from Zephaniah 3 in the Old Testament of the Bible. And in case you missed either of the earlier messages in our series, Zephaniah was a prophet of God who was delivering his message during a time when the nation of Israel, who were, who were supposed to be the people of God in his day, didn't, they didn't look very much like the people of God in practice. Now, they had a good king at the time named Josiah, who would eventually make a strong effort to fix that, but because as a people they neglected God's ways for so long by the time he reached the throne, Josiah was well into his ruling years before he even really knew that anything was off. Like, people just lived the way that other people and other nations lived. And until then, people, they did just whatever they wanted. And what they wanted, for the most part, were things that were corrupt and worldly and not at all in line with the will of God for them. And so, here's God. He sends his prophet Zephaniah. And if you read the little book that's attributed to him in the Bible, the book of Zephaniah, I keep saying this every week, the biggest part of it, there's only three chapters, I'm talking like the first two and a half chapters of that, it's kind of a rough read because it's all about God's judgment. And it's about how he's going to come and, and do this hard reset and bring his people back into line with his will and his purposes. And so there's, there's talk of whole communities being wiped out and buildings coming down and, and people uh, suffering the consequences of relentless disobedience over the course of many, many years. But as you get near to the end of the book, like if you're able to push through it and make it that far, there's a really hopeful message in the last half of the chapter uh, of chapter three that's kind of waiting there for us. It's, it's for those who've remained committed to the Lord. And the contrast is pretty dramatic, actually. It's kind of like when, you, you know, when you've been in the, a, a, a dark room for a while and someone comes in and turns on the light. Don't you love that? Like we used to do that to our kids when they were teenagers to get them up in the morning. And it takes a minute to adjust to it, right? because the light seems so foreign, but it's still light. And in the end, light is good. And in Zephaniah, the hopeful, light-filled message that the prophet brings to God's faithful followers uh, against the backdrop of all that dark judgment that he'd been talking about to that point, it consists of a couple of things. It consists of an encouragement that God is still present among us and among his people. And then that's followed by four quick promises that God makes. And it's these four promises, all, uh, by the way, unique expressions of, of his personal presence with us that, that we've been working through one at a time during our series together. And so just listen to this again. Uh, you've heard this before if you've listened in in our series earlier, uh, but these are the same verses I want to share with you again. Zephaniah 3, 16 to 17. It says, on that day, the announcement to Jerusalem will be, cheer up Zion. And that, of course, is the title we're using for our series. Cheer up, cheer up, Zion. Don't be afraid, for the Lord your God is living among you. And then here's the list of promises, or the start of it anyway. He sa it says, he is a mighty savior. That's what we talked about two messages ago. He will take delight in you with gladness. That was our focus last week. And the one we're adding this week is this. With his love, he will come all your fears. Just let that sink in for a minute. With his love, he will calm all your fears. See, I don't know if you've noticed, but fear is kind of a big thing these days in our world. And let me just say that as a human inclination, you know, fear isn't always that bad. There are times and occasions in our lives 
when I would suggest that maybe a little bit of healthy fear can actually be a bit of a gift to us. Like it might keep us from walking too close to the edge of a cliff somewhere, or it might make us a, a bit more careful when uh, there, we're around certain animals in the wild, or it might keep us from stepping out into street traffic. And like that's when a little bit of fear can be a good thing. But have you ever noticed that children don't always share the same kinds of fears that we do as grown-ups? They might not necessarily be afraid of cliffs and animals and cars in the same way that most grown-ups are, but they might be afraid of other seemingly random things like loud noises or the color purple or men with beards. You know, I, I remember one of our kids was afraid of toilets for a few years. Like that was a real treat when we were trying to get them ready to go to school. But the point is that while the instinct of fear is entirely natural, it's a normal human response to a perceived threat in our lives, the object of our fears are not always well-placed and the magnitude of our fears are not always well-informed. It's one of the characteristics of fear that's not always helpful. It attaches to something easily, but it lets go very hard. And over the years, even as adults, fear that is not well-placed or well-informed, I don't want to call it irrational fear because our minds are great at rationalizing things anyway, actually, you know, but, but over the years, even as adults, fear that is not well-placed or well-informed can begin to negatively affect us in all sorts of telltale ways. Like sometimes it affects our sleep patterns. Sometimes it affects our ability to relate to other people, even people we love. It gets complicated, you know. Sometimes it impacts our mood or our diet or our ability to do our work. And friends, understand this, you know, this, this is also true. Misplaced and misinformed fear can even affect our ability to live for God in the way we'd like. And it's important for us to talk about because we're living at a time right now on the planet where fear is on a pretty serious upswing. Like COVID-19 has been with us for a long time now. I think it's 19 months I'm counting. And back in July, at least in our province here in New Brunswick, when cases were low and vaccination rates were kind of trending up and restrictions were easing a little bit, on the whole, we were starting to feel a bit better. But then when case numbers started to climb again and new safety measures were being put back into place to kind of ease the strain on our healthcare system, it's like all of that became magnified even more than it was before. Have you noticed that? And some of what we're seeing in our world right now is a byproduct of fear. And just so I'm clear, like we can see it on both ends of the spectrum in terms of the social response. Like some people have insulated themselves even emotionally from other people. And they've chosen to kind of live their lives behind locked doors, both, both physically and, and, and figuratively. Like that's one end of it. People who retreat and close themselves off from the outside world. But then on the other end, we see another whole segment in our culture who are becoming maybe a little bit defiant even and openly critical of government and health officials over what is being viewed as a human rights issue. And make no mistake about it, one is as much a fear-based response as the other. And in case we haven't noticed, religious people aren't exempt. In fact, the disturbing trend we're seeing in some circles is that religious people are actually driving these polarizing fears. And whenever you have groups of people driving fear, religious or not, here's what inevitably happens. Fear grows. And the thing that people are fearful of changes proportionally in their minds. It just gets bigger. And so if I can just bring this back to Zephaniah again, let me point out that there is actually a biblical antidote to fear. Did you know that? There is something that when it is properly applied in a person's life and understood fully, it can actually begin to move the needle uh, on the impact that fear is able to have on us. And the antidote to fear is not insulation. It's not creating barriers to things and especially people who we care about and who care about us. That kind of bubble wrap approach to life can be very restrictive. And it's also not defiance and opposition, like creating an enemy by pointing fingers can be a, a type of self-justification that only serves to reinforce fear rather than make it go away. Friends, Zephaniah says that there is an antidote to fear, and here's what he says it is. The prophet Zephaniah says it's love, or, or more specifically, God's love. With his love, he will calm all your fears. 
And listen, because I know that that's a hard sentence to believe, but he was speaking directly to people who were living in a world of corruption. And he was speaking to people who would end up seeing some terrible things happening in their world, in their lifetime, as God righted the ship a little bit and, and needed to reset the course. And so they knew what it was like to have real fear in their lives. And the prophet says, but hey, listen, cheer up. <laughs> cheer up, friends, because with his love, God will calm all your fears. And to some people hearing that, it's kind of the equivalent of telling them, telling someone to relax or calm down. That doesn't go over very well, does it? In fact, some people might say it has the opposite effect at times. Relax. Don't tell me to relax. You relax. And I mean, Jesus did it too. He did it all the time when it came to people's fears. Some of you might remember in Mark 5 when, when Jairus, Jairus uh, came to Jesus because his daughter was dying. Guess what Jesus said to him? Don't be afraid. Just have faith, Jairus. Like, don't be afraid. The nerve, right? Of course the man was afraid. His daughter was dying. But here's Jesus. Relax, Jairus. It'll be okay. Don't be afraid. Back a chapter earlier in Mark 4 when Jesus was with his disciples in a sinking boat. And they literally had to wake him up. And, and when they do, you know, they're, they're really worried at that point. This is his response to him. Why are you afraid? Seriously, Jesus? Why are we afraid? The boat is sinking here. And I'm only referencing those situations in Jesus' life because it's entirely possible that someone listening to this feels that that's the only answer they've ever got for the fears that they have. Just don't be afraid. Just don't do it. And that doesn't feel helpful. And it's not helpful until you remember who Jesus is. It was John the Apostle who incidentally was there when uh, when the man came to Jesus about his daughter and, and was there on the boat when Jesus, with Jesus when it was sinking, it was John the Apostle who said in 1 John 4, we know how much God loves us and we have put our trust in his love. God is love and all who live in love live in God and God lives in them. And then listen to this. Such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. Friends, Jesus wasn't being insensitive by telling people to not be afraid. Sephaniah is not being naive when he said God will calm all of our fears. The Bible is just reminding us that our fears are all about projection, right? Like it's all about something we think is going to happen at some point down the road. And fear shows up when we assume that what will happen will not be in our best interest. But God, the God who loves us, was willing to die for us, already sees the end. That's his advantage. He knows the outcome because he's gone way ahead of us to make a way. You know, back a number of years ago, we took a group of people on a recovery mission to Haiti after an earthquake, that, that big earthquake that devastated a good part uh, of that island nation. And we've been to a lot of places, um, but truly have never seen poverty like that. And we were thankful for the opportunity to serve. God blessed it. But as we were driving back to the airport to catch our flight home, I'm just telling you, it, like it seemed like everything that could go wrong did go wrong. At one point, the drive shaft on the bus or something there, we were working, it fell apart somehow as we were driving, so we had to pull over quickly, temporarily fix that. Then we get caught in a protest parade of some kind or another. We didn't even know what that was, but we were in the middle of thousands of pedestrian people that brought us to a standstill for a while. That was a bit unnerving, actually. And when we reached the capital city of Port-au-Prince, the big city, we ran into a traffic jam there like none you've seen. In case you don't know this, Haitian traffic is not like North American traffic. The only rule is if you can squeeze in, squeeze in, and we were having trouble squeezing in. And so we didn't think we were going to make it to the airport on time. You know, that was our fear. But one of our Haitian hosts who was on the bus with us was a giant of a man, physically a giant of a man named Diddy. That's what we called him. And while no one else seemed to know what to do, without saying a word, Diddy casually just stepped out of the door on this bus and then disappeared into the traffic up ahead. And we didn't know where he went. Nobody was talking about it, you know. But after a minute or two, the traffic started moving again. And we were actually able to make some headway, got moving forward. And when we finally caught up to Diddy again, there he was, standing right out in the middle of traffic, just as if he had the authority to do it. Stopping cars in one direction, moving cars along in another direction, some of them honking and angry. That didn't faze him. And as we were passing by, he just jumped back on the bus with us as casually as he left, and we ended up making it to the airport with a few minutes left to spare. Friends, that's the picture of Jesus for us. 
That's the picture of how God works. And that's why he can tell us. Nobody else can do it, but he can tell us. He can just tell us in his word not to be afraid. It's because he can see the future we can't see. And he has the authority, actually real authority, to affect the outcome. And he loves us enough to bring us through to the other side. With his love, he will calm all your fears. So be cheerful, friends. Let's pray together. Father, on this Thanksgiving weekend, we want to tell you how much we love you and are thankful for you. We know that you love us. God, help us to allow your love to inform our lives in such a way that we might not be crippled by fear about anything. God, you know the things that trouble us, and we don't want to make light of any of it. We know how it sticks to us. But today, we are so thankful that we can be in a relationship with you, and that that relationship can make all the difference. And we bless your name today and invite you to make us a blessing to the world around us. In Christ's name.